Amen. Got all kinds of stuff up here today. Somebody put a clock here for me. <laughs> I've been going that long, I didn't know. Always like when the deacons hang the clock on the back wall for the pastor. That's always nice. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Happy Mother's Day again, ladies. Praise the Lord. My first, I guess, besides my home church, my first official sermon in a church. I've been preaching a lot already in youth camps and school assemblies and things like that. Uh, and then I just finished a youth camp and the pastor, and we'd had a real just breakout. God was moving youth camp and stuff. He says, tomorrow's, uh, you know, uh, Mother's Day. So it was like a youth weekend retreat we'd done. He says, why don't you, see, we just carry this on over to, to the service. I said, it was great. Well, I'd never preached Mother's Day, nor was I prepared to preach on Mother's Day. I got up and preached on you are neither hot nor cold, so I will spew you out of my mouth. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> we've learned a few things since then. We did have a great service, though. People were saved. Things were good, but uh, hallelujah. Not usually the sermon you're going to pick for Mother's Day title. I've, I have a message to share with you, and it's from a, a passage, and, you know, one of the the apex passages of scriptures, I believe, are, is the cross. Amen. The Lord Jesus is on the cross. And so today's message is thank God for mom and seven ways to, to, to love your mom. And uh, the passage I share, want to share with you today is out of John chapter 19. In just a couple of verses, Jesus is hanging on the cross in these verses, paying the eternal price for our sin. It says, when Jesus therefore saw his mother, she's at the foot of the cross, and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. Now, Jesus isn't saying to her, behold me. He's saying, he's talking about John. So he said, look to John. And to John, he says, you know, behold your mother. Now, the, the powerful part about this, Mary's standing there, she's witnessing the crucifixion at the very foot of the cross. I mean, the most awesome moment in eternity outside the resurrection of Jesus, all right, is Jesus dying on the cross for our sins, paying the eternal price for our sins. This is, I mean, this is, this is the climax moment of all history at this moment, where Jesus, the Son of God, offers himself as a sacrifice for the sins of all mankind, the most important important task he's been called to on, 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 in his earthly ministry is now being accomplished in his obedience to the Father. And in the middle of all this, the greatest weight of glory being laid down upon Jesus and, and of our sin, in the midst of all this, he's taking care of his mother, making reference to his mother, telling John to look after his mother, telling his mother to look after John and to, 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 to respond to him as, as family. I mean, you can't even imagine how she must have began to feel to start with just watching her son in agony. But then the moment where her son pays such bold attention to her in, this, in the context of, all, you know, the, the, every statement that Jesus is making on the cross is just this prophetic statement. This one stands out just kind of, wow, it's, it's this moment of recognition. Not only is he doing this divine duty of heaven as God's son, he's also attending to his earthly duties as her son and responding to her as her mother. He went on the cross, he bore the weight of our sin, but yet in the midst of all this, he sees to it to make sure that his mom is taken care of after he's gone. Eternal matters are being dealt with here, but at the same time are these practical matters where God's showing his special love even for his Jesus as he shares for his, his, his own earthly mother. I, I just don't believe, you know, and look at the context of what Jesus has done here and the light of all that he's doing along with this, his response to his mom. I, you know, I just don't think it's possible to, to willingly be wrong with your mother and be right with God. Amen. I mean, that, that may sound like a tough statement. You say, well, my mother, don't give me all that. Right. You're still called in scripture, and we'll look at it in a moment, what the Bible says to honor your mother and father. So if your mother's still alive, regardless of your age, regardless of her age, you can love her. Amen. And you choose to love her and you make a point to love her. In fact, as I said in the sermon title, there's seven, seven ways to, to show love to your mom, to, to express your love for your mom. Now, for those of you who want to be really get a hold of a real powerful nail biting sermon this morning, this is not so much sermonizing. It is devotionalizing. These points are brief, but yet they, in their brevity, they're extremely important points that I think we need to, to, to learn to respond to. 
This is an interesting Mother's Day for me. This is the first Mother's Day without my mom. And she went on to be with the Lord in, in Christmas. And so uh, at the same time that you bear a little bit of a grief and sorrow, there is a joy of knowing the kind of mom that she was and how much she loved God and how much she, she loved her kids and how much her kids loved her. But there's always something we can learn no matter how much you love your mom because we can say it in our heads all day long, but we might not always express it with our lives. And this is about expressing it not just you know, with your life, but also with your words. So we'll start with point number one, love your mom verbally. Especially men have this philosophy, you know, I don't have to say I love you, you know, I'll show you I love you by my works, you know, just because you see what I do, then you know that I love you. But man, it's important that you use those words, all right? I spoke to a man at the service this morning, he says, you know, I've always made a point to tell my mom not love you, but I love you. To personalize that pronoun, for I love you, you know, that, that, that it's understood. It, don't be like the guy who married his wife 40 years later. You know, he's looking at her and she says, honey, you never say you love me. He says, honey, I told you I loved you 40 years ago. If I change my mind, I'll let you know. <laughs> don't be that guy. Your children need to hear it. Your spouse needs to hear it. It needs to be said and it needs to be expressed. I love you. Let's try it together. I love you. All right, try that on mom today at least once, all right? There's an article called, uh, oh, I wrote the title, it's called Missing Mary in Colorado. It was written in one of the Dear Abby columns years ago, but I think it makes the point here. He says, uh, he tells the story of Dear Abby, I enlisted into the military shortly after Pearl Harbor, the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor. He said, 36 days later, I was on my way to the Philippines. He said, but en route to the Philippines, you know, it fell to the Japanese. And we were routed, rerouted to Australia. He says, 11 days after we landed in Australia, I met the most beautiful girl in the world. On our first date, I told her, I'm going to marry you. And I did, 18 months later, while on a 10-day R&R leave from New Guinea. And after more than 57 years of marriage and two children, he said, my beloved Mary died five days before Christmas. Although we agreed to, that our ashes were to be scattered over the mountains, I found I just could not part with hers. While Mary was alive, she would frequently say, you just don't know how much I love you. I'd reply, likewise. I never said, I love you. Now her ashes are on my dresser. While I tell her several times a day how much I love her, it's too late. He said, I wrote poetry to her and things to her, but I just couldn't bring myself to say those three words. I knew that she wanted to hear the most. I love you. And she was dying. I even thought she was comatose. I told her, Mary, there are not enough words to tell you how much I love you. After a few hours later, she whispered, not enough words, and she passed. She says, the reason I'm writing is to urge men to express their feelings while their loved ones are alive. I don't know why, but many men are reluctant to express the depth of their feelings. Signed, Missing Mary in Colorado. Your wife needs to hear those words. Your children need to hear your families are their important words. You say, well, I show it. You need to also love verbally, say it. Second thing, I want you to get this one, is that you love her physically. We're talking about when's the last time you gave mama a genuine big hug? When's the last time you held her hand? When's the last time you kissed her on the cheek? You are just sat on the couch and, and sat beside her for a while. When was that the last time? Think about this for a moment. Touching mom. She's the first one who ever touched you. In fact, she was in your, in her, you were in her womb for nine months, approximately. And then you were handed to her. You're the first one. She was the first one that embraced you. She was the first one who hugged you. She's the first one who held you and nursed you and took care of you. She's the first one who rubbed your little feet and rubbed your little fat cheeks against hers. She's the one who gave you the little head rubbed and took care of you. And all these things she did as an expression of her love for you. She was touching and touching. She's the one who said, give me a little sugar. And you were slobbering all over the face and <laughs> gave her a little sugar. And she loved it. Amen. You'd give her the bear hugs. You'd hold on so tight you'd about to choke her back in those days. But she constantly told you, she changed her dirty diapers. Goodness gracious. Last time I did that for one of the grandkids, I remembered those awful moments. <laughs> you know? Just, wow. Thank God for mom. <laughs> You'd be still sitting in those dirty diapers. She potty trained you. She wiped the snotty noses. 
She wiped that whatever it was off your face, you lick her thumb and scrub it off. <laughs> Mom is always touching you. And now she deserves for you to be touched. Don't lick your thumb and wipe her face off, okay? <laughs> I'll let you know from every mother I ever talked to, that meant a lot more than candy and flowers. The time to love physically and to express your love. Love her patiently. I was interested, you know, when census time come around or when job applications are given out to, to moms and they're taken up and our situations are coming across and a lot of times they ask, what's your occupation? And in census, they list at this. If you're, if you're a housewife and a mother, it's no occupation. She rises up at daybreak, you know, she takes off on a, on a maddening race. She's involved from everything from picking up clothes to putting up clothes to ironing clothes to fixing meals to bagging lunches to taking, becoming mom taxi ride. She cleans the rooms one by one. She constantly, I mean, the, she just, there's no place usually for real vacations. But yeah, it's always interesting since this time comes, no occupation. Don't insult the mother that way, amen. Constantly taking, don't ever make that mistake of asking a lady, do you work or stay at home? The only thing you can ask that's worse than that is when she's due, if you're not 100% sure she's pregnant. <laughs> Amen. Gentlemen, that's a good lesson to learn. But just love her patiently, you know. She needs the expression of consistent, patient love. And you say, why do you say it? Because it's, it's such a, a tendency when you have someone around you like a mom who's constantly serving you to just, you know, just become impatient. You know, you, you've had something in the same place. Mom is taking care of folding your underwear, putting a certain place for years. And you want to know one day, where's my underwear? <laughs> you know, and the impatience of that. You, you've gotten so used. It, it's, it's like showing up at someone's door every day and knocking on the door and giving them $50. They say, oh, that's great. Man, they love you. Next day, you go back and give them another 50. That's great. Do this for about two weeks. Then let a week get by and then show up with another, with, and knock on the door and they'll say, where's my 50 bucks from those days? That's the attitude that can be easily expressed if we are not very careful, especially as kids and even as, as, as dads. Mom deserves a whole lot better than that. All right. So here's an article that kind of gives you an idea. It was turned into Focus on the Family, James Dobson's people. And it was from a mother to her family members on her 80th birthday. She says, to all my children, I suppose my upcoming birthday started my thoughts along these lines. This is a good time to tell you that what I truly want are things that I can never get enough of, yet they are free. What I want for my birthday are the intangibles. I'd like for you to come and sit with me and to be relaxed. I'd like for you to just come and talk, or we can just be silent. I'd just like for us to be together. She went on to say, I need your patience when I don't hear you the first time what you say. I know how tiresome it is that I, it is to always be repeating, but sometimes I must ask you to repeat. So I need your patience. I need your patience when I think too much about the past. I need your patience with my slowness and my set ways. I want you to be tolerant with the years, what the years have done to me physically. Please be understanding about my personal care habits. I spill things now. I lose things. I get unduly excited when I try to figure out my bank statement. I can't remember what time to take my medications or if I already took them. I take too many naps. And sometimes that's just how I pass the day. And the article went on, but you get the idea about loving mom patiently. Also along with this is to, the four things to love her attentively. You know, mothers always listen to their children as their hearts are being poured out. And mothers have this just constant way of having this sympathetic ear that, that, that they always have and that you can always turn to. Even as an adult, my mom always had that sympathetic ear that when I need to discuss something or share something or tell her what was going on, she would sit and she would listen carefully and she would listen, I, I would almost say skillfully to hear what I was saying and to pick up on what I was saying so she could respond Sometimes with just a uh-huh, sometimes with a word from God, sometimes with just a pat on the back. She was there, always being attentive to what was being said. A couple of years ago, there was a TV documentary that, that, was, that was about serial killers. Guys that were on death row and there were serial killers. Some had killed up to 30-something people. They interviewed these serial killers and then they interviewed their moms. And invariably, invariably, the moms would say, oh, he's such a good boy. 
Interviewer might say something like this. Yes, man, but he slaughtered 37 people with an ax. Oh, but he's got a good heart. <laughs> That's mom, amen. <laughs> always ready to forgive. Always there, always taking it. But you have to realize that there's an attentive factor that you need in turn to have. That is willing to overlook maybe some of the failures that you might think in your own heart are failures. But the idea here that your parents, especially the older they get, they have fears. They have anxieties. They dealt with your fears and your anxieties as you were growing up. And I think it's important that we remember that we deal and help deal with our parents' fears and anxieties as they are getting ready to go meet the Lord. You can only hope, you know, to be treated, you know, the way that we would want to be treated at that point in our life. The fifth thing is, Love her gratefully. And this kind of goes back to where's my underwear kind of thing, you know. Uh, we just we forget to be grateful about all that's being done for us and all that has been done for us. Can you think back over the years, and I, it, this is for you that are in high school, junior high as well, children, okay, all the things that your mom has done for you that you just expected to be done because she's mom. She made a willing commitment and a willing sacrifice to be mom. And to have that kind of expression of love in her life towards you. There ought to be something in your life that says, that's a constant in your life, that expresses gratitude. An attitude of that. That just says, thank you, Mom, I realize what you're doing. Not that when she's late, maybe picking you up, somebody's saying, well, what you are you so late for? You're supposed to be in there 10 minutes ago. Hey, what you need is a slap upside the head. <laughs> Amen? You've been dragging around all day taking care of your stuff. Dealing with your stuff. Some of you have this opportunity right now. You're really living in the best days. You say, what do you mean? Some of you are living in, in some really great days. You have your children and you have your parents. Take advantage of the beautiful time that that really represents of those generations on both sides of you because it always won't be there. It should, it should help you to realize, you know, one thing about parents is you don't always have them. There comes a time when they will step into glory. Take the opportunity to love them gratefully even now. I think it was Tim uh, Strickland told me about, about this, this, this illustration a, a long time ago about an elementary science class teacher who, who'd been lecturing and teaching the students on, on magnets and what it is about magnets and the metals are attracted to each other and the polar ends of the magnets and stuff. So as she was preparing the semester exam, she decided she would put one of the questions on the exam about magnets. And at the end of the semester, she puts the exams out and she says, there's six letters in this word that start with M and it picks up things. What am I? Over half the class put down mother. <laughs> now, I don't know if she gave him a failing grade for that or gave him an A plus for that. It should have been an A plus. At least some of the students realize that mom's always picking up things. Amen. The sixth thing is, is you love her, love her generously. There's nothing too good for mom. You can't ever repay her, you know, but we ought to die trying before she does. We ought to try to express gratitude for all that she's done. I mean, she didn't spend on herself. I know my mom never spent on herself unless everybody else's needs were met. And I don't remember her spending on herself, you know. We had six kids, and then she, she, in a moment of insanity, she married a man with six kids. <laughs> you know, about a third of us were already out of the house when that union took place. But even, you know, with 12 kids, every Christmas, my mom would provide a Christmas present for each family. Now, very moderate income that they lived on. And even in retirement, they did this. It was amazing. Now, my stepdad, and of course, if I had 12 kids hanging around, yeah, I'd be the same way. He was quite frugal. Some people just say he's tight. You know, he's tight what? My mom always made it sure that no matter what, everybody got what was needed. She would say, if you gave her money for Christmas or you gave her money for her birthday, you know where it went? It went back to a little fund that she had for giving gifts out of and making sure that gifts were given. And how many moms in this room, over and over, how many times have you passed over your need to meet the need of your kids or to meet the need of your family just because there was a need there? You took care of them. So you, you, you learn how at this point to, to really honor your mama. She's been as generous for you. You can be generous for her. 
back to school, there was a math teacher giving a, a lesson on fractions and they had a little test question and the question went like this. If there's 10 people at the table and there's one apple pie, how much does each person get? One boy put down one ninth. Teacher says, you don't know your fractions. There's 10 people, one pie, how many pieces? Oh, you don't know my mother. <laughs> if there's that many people at the table, she not eating any pie. She's going to make sure everybody has a good slice of pie. That's the kind of mom I had. That's the kind of mom that many of you have. So she clears her schedule. She runs her life around the family. She runs her life around you. She gives you opportunities. She passes up opportunities so that you can have opportunities. So you love your mom today and realize you begin to love mom generously. The seventh and the last thing is love mom honorably. Exodus 20, 21. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Do you realize this is one of the Ten Commandments? In fact, this is the only one of the Ten Commandments that comes with a promise of a blessing. It kind of shows you the, the value that God puts upon this commandment. You know? So, well, I just thought that meant if I didn't honor my mom and my father, they'd take me out. <laughs> Honor your mother and your father so that you may live long in the land your Lord, your God is giving you. Listen, it's important to realize that honor is something that always is given to your family. The Bible talks about obey your parents as long as you're in the home and as long as you're under their headship and as long as you're under their training, then you, you obey and honor. But once you leave the home, you always still honor your mother and your father. If there's one thing you should always be doing is be cautious and careful with your words and your attitudes and your actions so that what you do, what you say, and how you respond is always honorable to your mother. So you'll love them honorably. I'll close with this one illustration. And for those who, are, who love the Word of God as I do and love preaching, please be forgiving. This is not real biblical, but it is reality. <laughs> When the good Lord created mothers, it says, he was in the sixth day of overtime. When the angel of the Lord appeared, said, uh, oh, you're doing a lot of fiddling around on this one. As he works on moms. The Lord said, have you seen the specs on this order? She has to be completely washable, but not plastic. She has 180 movable parts, all replaceable, run on black coffee and leftovers. Have a lap that disappears when she stands up. A kiss that can cure anything from broken legs to a disappointing love affair. And six pair of hands. The angel shook her head and said, six pair of hands? No way. The Lord said, well, it's not the hands that are causing me problems. It's the three pair of eyes that she has to have. One pair that sees through that closed door and asks, what are you kids doing in there? When she already knows. Another in the back of her head that sees what she shouldn't, but what she needs to know. And of course, those ones in the front that look at a child when he goose up and says, I understand and I love you. Without so much as uttering a word, she does this. He says, you know, I'm so close to creating something so close to myself. Already I have one who heals herself when she's sick. She can feed a family of six on one pound of hamburger. That was my family. And get a nine-year-old to stand under a shower. Not only can she think, she can reason, she can compromise. Finally, the angel bent over and ran his finger across the cheek of the mother. There's a leak, the angel said. I told you you're trying to put too much in there. Or is it, that's, that's not a leak, it's a tear. A tear, what's that for? It's for joy, for sadness, for disappointment, for pain, for loneliness, pride. The angel said, you're a genius. He said, uh, Lord said, I, di I didn't put the tear there. How about now a hand with the crowning jewel of, of God's creation? What is the crowning jewel of God's creation? I believe today, remember that God is the one who set up the family, the structure, the order, a mom, a dad, a family. We need to honor moms as God has told us to honor moms. So I'm going to ask you to give a rip-rousing, roaring round of applause for our moms today. Amen. I mean, make some noise. Hallelujah. Thank God for mom. Come on, stand up. Let me sit there. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
As we close the service today, I'm going to ask our moms to for just to slip out and meet me right here. In fact, let me, I'm going to come down. You stand up right there where you are, mom. <laughs> stand up, moms. All right. Every mom in here, stand up. We want to pray for you. If you're with your mom today, you're by your mom, I want you to reach out and just put your hand on her. Would you do that? Just put your hand on her. If your mom's not here with you today, then find some mom that in our church or in your community that you can call today and encourage them. There's a lot of moms whose kids have gone on before them and face that difficult task of doing that. I want you let them know today. You think about those names in our heart. You give them a call. You tell them Happy Mother's Day. Somebody to respond to that for them would change their day and would bless their life immensely. But I'm going to ask you if they are by your mom, just put a hand on her. Or even a husband, if you want to just pray for your wife as, as the mother of your home. But I want us just to bow our heads and